Okay, so I think we have a good number of people and we do want to uh, really respect your time and the time that you've dedicated to spend with us here today. So we're just gonna get started. Uh, my name is Joy Sebe. Uh, I'm the Assistant Director of Open Doors for Multicultural Families. And before we even launch into our title slide, I want to provide some instructions for you on closed captioning. Closed captioning is enabled for this webinar. And if you would like to hide the captioning, then you uh, can go down to the bottom of your screen and then the bottom of your Zoom screen and then click on, click just to the right of the arrowhead that, uh, of the arrowhead that has the button on it that says CC live transcript. And then you'll click on hide subtitle if you find that you would prefer no closed captioning. And then if, uh, if you'd like to change the size of your captions, then you can click on subtitle settings and then it'll pull up a window like the one you see on the right hand side with a sliding scale as indicated by this red circle. Uh, and then you can just change that sliding scale to adjust the size of the closed captioning to really fit uh, what works best for you. Uh, so with that, I'm going to move us along and uh, start our webinar. Okay, so thank you so much for coming uh, and joining us at this webinar for educators and professionals. Uh, and community members really on working effectively with interpreters. This is uh, brought to you by the Inclusionary Practices Professional Development Project, Family Engagement Collaborative, and really represents a rich uh, collaboration and partnership by Open Doors for Multicultural Families, the Washington State Office of Education Ombuds, and our really remarkable interpreter, Fanny Cordero, who are very grateful has joined us today with her expertise. Okay, so our goals for today, we're going to spend a little bit of time sharing with you who we are. Uh, and then uh, those of you who haven't shared who you are, we'll just ask you to share that in the chat. We're going to provide an introduction to language access. And then we're going to going to review some videos and reflect on them. We'll be taking then a short break and then moving into digital considerations um, for language access in this remote world. We'll be sharing three communication tools and then providing an update on, on policy change. Okay, so with that, I'm, I, we're gonna move us through introductions of our panelists today. And I just want to uh, really express my deep gratitude for the panelists who are joining us today, uh, who have so much expertise in different parts of Washington State, and then different roles that we play in Washington State. Uh, the panelists that you see here on this slide, we really came together uh, in a more intensive way through the Washington State Language Access Work Group. And that work group was, uh, was mandated by legislation in 2019. Uh, that work group came together to provide policy recommendations for the implementation of high quality, reliable language access across our state. Uh, and so the, our panelists here per, are just a representation of the members of that work group. And so I'll start us off. My name is Joy Sebe. I'm the Assistant Director of Open Doors for Multicultural Families and a parent of two children in Seattle Public Schools. Moses, off to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Moses Perez. I am the Advocacy and Civic Engagement Program Manager at uh, Open Doors for Multicultural Families. Nice to be here. Danielle? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Danielle Eidenberg. I'm one of the Education Ombuds in the Governor's Office of the Education Ombuds, and I'm really happy that all of you were able to join us today. Jordana? 
Hi everyone, I'm your Donald Scubber Amlak. I work with Danielle in the Washington State Governor's Office of the Education Ombuds, also a senior education ombuds. So wonderful to be here with all with all of you. Fanny. Hello everyone. I'm Fanny Cordero. I'm a freelance independent interpreter and translator. My languages are Spanish and English, and it's so good to see so many of you joining us in this talk today. Thank you, everyone. And so now I uh, we're just going to go through and read. I'm going to just spend some time uh, reading through your introductions in the chat. And if you can continue to in the chat, please share your name, role, what city or school district you're in. You can share more information if you would like, like what pets you may have. But certainly, we'd, we'd like to get to know you a, a, little, a little bit about you. So I'm just going to go through what uh, I see here. We have uh, Robin Taff from Northwest Center in King County. Welcome, Robin. And Kat Neiman, who's a speech pathologist with Kindering for Birth to Three. Welcome, Kat. Um, Pam Bainbridge with Family Resources Coordinator, Child Strive. Welcome, Pam. Uh, we have Rebecca Washington, Director of Special Programs at Oak Harbor Public Schools, and Deanna Kilga, Assistant Principal uh, of MG High School, Marysville School District. Kelsey, who's a Referral Manager from Child Haven. Evelyn Guerra, who's uh, President of the ODMF, Open Doors Multicultural Families Board, uh, and Angelica Alvarez, the Puget Sound ESD uh, student number 121 family, student and community uh, engagement. Welcome, Angelica. It's nice to see you here in my chat. Uh, and we have Michelle Murphy from Lower Columbia College. Uh, and you have two dogs, two cats, and one awesome 17 year old old boy. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing, Michelle. Uh, Donna, it's nice to see you again. You're a parent ambassador and really a powerful advocate as well. I know you from other spaces and Perla Gambola, she, her, a uh, pro pronouns. I oversee language access at the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries. You're in Tacoma. I'm in Tacoma and I have a bilingual daughter in her first year of high school. Wonderful. So please continue to just introduce yourselves in the chat. It's so wonderful that you are here, all here to join us and really from really diverse um, roles, I would say, in diverse parts of Washington State. And this is just so encouraging that you're all joining us here. Uh, so I can tell you a little bit about Open Doors for Multicultural Families. Uh, we were found uh, it, 11 years ago now, and our mission is to engage and partner with culturally and linguistically diverse individuals with developmental and or intellectual disabilities and their families. We really uh, emphasize our use of a cultural brokerage model uh, in which we uh, use our uh, higher uh, bilingual and bicultural staff and staff who come from the communities we're serving to help families and individuals navigate services, to provide specialized programming, and to advocate for systems change. Off to OEO. Thanks, Joy. Um, so OEO, the Washington State Governor's Office of the Education on Buds, was created in 2006 uh, by the legislator. Um, and we work to address barriers so that students can um, adequately access public K-12 in Washington State. Um, our work can be seen in sort of three buckets. There's the case work where we work with one family at a time. Um, and anyone one can reach out to our office with an individual student concerns, but with the casework, we work one family at a time to address questions um, and concerns that come up. There's also training that we do for groups or families or um, sometimes get called in by community based organizations to work with um, teams there um, or educators. Um, and there's also the policy work that we do where we sit on different policy committees and that really gives us a chance to use the casework that we see um, day to day to really help influence policy.
Hi, everyone. I'm Fanny Cordero, and I've been interpreting and translating for more than 15 years. My working languages are Spanish and French. I am a DSHS certified medical and social services interpreter and a certified translator. I'm also a candidate for the court certification exam. And I'm happy to join all of you today because I, I care about communication and language access. It's very dear to my heart. So I, I'm so thrilled to be here and I wanna thank uh, Open Doors and OEO for inviting me to be with you today. As an independent freelance interpreter, I've worked with nonprofit organizations, public schools, universities, state agencies, and law firms. I am a member of NOTICE, the Northwest uh, Translator and uh, Interpreter Society, and WASLA, the Washington Language Access Coalition. And these are two organizations that also offer many resources for interpreters and educators. In 2019, I was selected to serve in the OSBI Language Access Group. That's where I met Joy, actually from before that time. But I got to, a chance to work more closely with Joy and Danielle and Giordanos. And I am a member of the ITE work group, which is the interpreting and translating and education work group. And that is a, we're engaged in a national conversation regarding standards for educational interpreters and translators. Next slide. Interpreting is a demanding job that takes years of experience, skill, and hard work. Professional interpreters invest in their training and performance skills through continuing education where we expand and further our memory skills, vocabulary, note-taking, and learn to integrate now all these new technologies that are coming at us. Qualified interpreters strive to be competent in all three modes, consecutive, simultaneous, and sight. In consecutive mode, which is predominant in IEP meetings, the educator speaks followed by pause and then the interpreter speaks. In simultaneous, the interpreter is interpreting at the same time or just about as a speaker and uses wireless equipment or a headset so two people aren't speaking out loud at the same time. Simultaneous requires a high skill and stamina. ASL interpreters for the deaf always work in simultaneous mode and in teams to relieve each other. So when planning events that are longer than one hour, do consider uh, planning for two interpreters. In IEP meetings, we have many medical terms and legal concepts and acronyms, uh, PWN, SLP, LRE. Interpreters working with educators need to become familiar with these terms and prep for appointments. This is important because currently there is no specific certification for interpreters in education settings and interpreter skills vary. I prep for my appointments, which can be reviewing a glossary or looking up certain acronyms and the certifications of medical and legal. Well, we know children and parents are not defendants and they're not necessarily patients. So it, it's, it's a little bit of an integration of all those skills. Experienced interpreters know what to do in situations where communication is not flowing. They'll ask for clarification, repetition, inform if they cannot hear or have a bad connection. And as an educator, you may be in a meeting where the interpreter is not as experienced. So your knowledge will be important in facilitating and maintaining the communication flow. We will explore this and more in this webinar. Thank you so much, Fanny. Uh, and so I'm going to just move us into a brief introduction, just very brief on the Inclusionary Practices Professional Development Project that is funding this webinar. Uh, in 2019, the Washington State Legislature funded uh, uh, the IPP or the Inclusionary Practices Project by providing an appropriation of $25 million to support professional development to in, enhance inclusive practices across Washington State. And so this, uh, 
we have a host of uh, professional development partners uh, and cadre members across our state who have been fanning out for the past two, well, almost two years, I would say, a year and a half to provide professional development across our state to improve outcomes for students with disabilities and students really in general. Uh, and I will just want to call out this schematic here that's on the left hand side of the screen, which shows concentric circles with students in the center and then parents and families, educators, district and school leaders, and then professional development partners. Uh, and if you go to the IPP uh, theory of action page, you'll really see uh, language that calls out the need for culturally responsive approaches. And I'm just going to read this quote here because it's so relevant to our presentation today. A culturally responsive approach centers the experiences of students with disabilities and their families, particularly students of color and groups who have traditionally been denied a voice in decision making. And so we really believe, and I'm sure all of you do, because you're here with us, that communication is really the first step to culturally responsive family engagement. And so that's why it's so important for our families who have language access needs that we work effectively with interpreters. And our webinar today will focus on working with spoken language interpreters uh, because the, the language access strategies for use of spoken language versus American Sign Language interpreters and other interpreters are uh, different, quite different. So today we'll be focusing on working effectively with spoken language interpreters. Joy? Yes, Moses. Yeah, I had a question um, that came through when I just saw it. I apologize. It said, is, is Open Doors active on the eastern side of Washington State? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, Open Doors is really primarily focused on King County, and I would say South King County, uh, and a little bit in Pierce and Thurston County, but that's uh, our clients are coming primarily from South King County. So that may be a reason why some of you uh, haven't heard of us before, but uh, you know, that's why we have our partners at OEO who are statewide. All right, Danielle. Yep. Thank you very much, Moses. Before we um, go further into a conversation about language access, we wanted to address what we mean by language access. Um, and access to information from the school system to families whose primary language is other than English or who are deaf, hard of hearing, or blind and visually impaired um, is the kind of access we mean by language access. So we're talking about communication um, between families and educators on behalf of students. Qualified interpreters are needed to offer this meaningful communication um, that can lead to effective, culturally responsive family engagement as Joy was discussing earlier. Um, translation of vital documents is also critical in order to provide language access to families. Next slide. Um, thank you, Danielle. Um, and we also have a legal obligation both on a federal level and then also more locally at the state level. Um, the first three out of the four that are on the screen, and I'll also be reading them out loud, are um, federal. Um, so, for example, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits uh, discrimination, uh, for example, on the basis of um, national origin. Um, second one, also federal executive order 13166, um, which was signed in the summer of um, 2000. Um, basically, um, if I were to sum that up, although it, it's, I would highly, highly suggest taking a look when you have a moment. Um, but if you've heard the acronym LEP, Limited, limited English uh, Proficiency, so um, institutions that receive federal funding, um, really um, taking a look at where those gaps are, making sure that there's a plan in, in place so that families, uh, LEP families can access um, the activities that are going on at that federally funded place, um, like our, our schools. 
Um, and then there's individuals with um, Disabilities and Education Act um, idea. Um, you may have heard of idea in connection to IEPs, individualized education um, programs. Um, and then um, also more locally, um, the, the uh, WAC that's listed there, 392172A. Um, oh, and my caption's actually blocking my view, but locally, um, if whenever you have a moment again to take a look at this WAC, and this talks about the meaningful exchange of information for families so that they can adequately engage in their students' education um, with regard to um, students who receive special education services. And I'm going to pass it on back to Danielle. So um, Jordana's just addressed, why is language access important? It's important because we know that um, family engagement in education is one of the best ways to predict a student's success in school. And effective communication between families and educators is, um, is the first step towards building strong partnerships um, on behalf of students. So language access is really critical to student success and student achievement in school. And I would always say, and I'll go through some um, examples of when an interpreter or translated documents may be needed, but I would say just trust your, uh, lean into your real world situation that may be unfolding uh, before your eyes, right? I think that more often than not, there is, you know, a respectful way to just kind of check in in the process to see if an interpreter, you know, might be needed and really stressing the importance of um, wanting to make sure that you're providing meaningful information and that you're also um, you're also able to receive information uh, in a way that is adequate um, to continue to build that relationship. And so just lean into that and, and just kind of respectfully check in, right, to see if there might be support that's needed. Um, but just to kind of give examples if there hasn't been an opportunity to work with an interpreter um, or if folks haven't had an opportunity to um, navigate situations when translated documents have been needed. Um, you know, one example could be a deaf parent of a hearing child and say the student gets hurt, um, say at recess and needing to communicate or um, parents who um, have a question um, for office staff about forms. It could be registering their student. It could be filling out the lunch form. Um, so there might there might be an interpreter that's needed there, or um, there might be documents that need to be translated into the, the family's primary language. And then other examples too, I and mean, I've actually heard this quite a bit, where families um, may be able to have more conversational discussions with staff. So say they're dropping off their student um, and you know they see the educator or um, office staff that they typically see every day, and they're able to you know, ask how staff is doing, uh, share how, you know, I'm tired today or, or uh, you know, gosh, it's cold outside. But then having discussion about their students' education, that's completely different, completely different ballgame, right? And so instances where there might be um, an ability to have some communication in English, but just keeping in mind that um, Talking about like the weather or hi, you know, how are you or I hope you're well uh, is, is can be very different than talking about, say, discipline. Thank you so much, Jordanos uh, and Danielle. And so we just want to kind of take another moment to connect back with you all. And in the chat, if you can write out uh, what languages are spoken in your school district or charter school or even in your own family, um, that would be wonderful to see the level of linguistic diversity across our state. And I know with, uh, oh, and we see, uh, will we have a copy of the slides trying to keep up with the notes? Absolutely. I will post a copy of these slides on the Family Engagement Collaborative website um, once our webinar is over. And Moses, if you can post in the chat the link to the fecinclusion.org website uh, where, I will, where we will be uh, posting these slides, that would be great. Okay, 
And thank you so much for that question. I'm sure many people had that same question. And I see a lot of the languages spoken. I'm just going to take some time to read it out. Spanish, English, Russian, Somali, Swahili, English, Mandarin, Cantonese, Kurdish, Arabic, Somali, and many more. Uh, Spanish spoken in my home and my district speaks over a hundred languages. We also have Amharic, uh, Mandarin, Nepali, uh, Mixteco, Kichi, Korean, Telugu, uh, Thai, um, Japanese. I speak Japanese in my home, and Hindi, Vietnamese, Marathi, German, Russian, Cambodian, uh, Beng Bengla, Samoan, Tagalog, Marshallese, ASL, Chukis. I just love, I think we all love all of this linguistic diversity uh, that is accompanied with cultural diversity that's coming in through the chat. So thank you all for sharing that. And also uh, please kind of liberally use the, um, use the Q and A. Our, uh, all of us are monitoring the Q and A and we're gonna do our best to answer your questions as well. And we see uh, Dari Aromo, uh, Indonesian, in, ad in addition to all of the languages, Ukrainian. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing uh, that linguistically di linguistic diversity with us. So we're gonna uh, now launch a poll just to get to know your role um, a little better. And so you'll see a poll here that Moses will launch in just a bit. Uh, Moses, if you can go ahead and launch that poll. And it says, which one of the following describes you? Uh, and pick all that apply. Um, and there's a number of options here. Oh, okay. Moses, his internet went down. So I'm gonna launch this poll. And here we go. That's why we have backups. All right. So, Danielle, you can nod if you see this poll on your end. Got it. All right. So we see uh, there are all these results coming in through the poll. And I'm going to give it just a few more um, seconds here to get all of your responses coming in. Right now we're about 50%, a little bit more than 50% in terms of respondents to the poll. We're at 60% now um, and they're still coming in. So I'm gonna close it in just a little bit, but we do see a lot of diversity across who is represented here. So thank you everyone and let me just end the polling all right because now we're at 73 percent i'm going to share the results of the poll so you can see that we have we have a well i'm so happy that we have a student here we have some families and parents general education teachers special education teachers paraeducators um, administrators school psychologist, counselor, interpreter, nonprofit staff. And so uh, if you don't see yourself represented in this poll, please feel free to put your role in the chat. Unfortunately, Zoom only allows us to put up to 10 options in the polling. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing the results and kind of move us on uh, to our next section here. And, uh, and here we go. All right, so thank you again for sharing all of those, uh, that, that all of those parts of, you know, your role throughout our state. And so next we're gonna review and reflect on some video clips of uh, a sample IEP meeting. And just so you know, we're not gonna show a full IEP meeting, just, just so that you're not worried about that. Um, 
And um, just uh, kind of, I'm, I'm gonna make you co-host again, Moses. There you go. All right, you should, you should be co-host again. All right, so we're gonna watch six short clips, short clips of uh, about a 10 minute video. Uh, and then after each clip, we're gonna reflect on a question. So we're mixing it up a little bit uh, with reflecting on a question via a poll or a chat. And before we go through, we wanna make sure to really thank the North Clackamas School District uh, for creating this wonderful YouTube video that we were found online as we were searching for resources and tools to share with you. And so if anyone knows anyone in the North Clackamas School District, please thank them for us. I've tried to reach out, but I haven't been able to connect. Okay, and Moses, if you can, uh, at, you know, at your own speed, as your internet comes up, please share that uh, link in the chat. Uh, but stay with us, please, everyone, so that we can kind of view the videos together. All right, so this first video that I'm going to show uh, is a, it shows two different briefings. One is a briefing prior to an IEP meeting between an interpreter and a parent, and then uh, the interpreter and then the educator. And so just kind of take a, take a look at what's happening here. And um, just a moment as I start this video. My name is Daniel. I'm going to interpret this evening. A parent briefing is essential. Interpreters should arrive five to 10 minutes before the meeting. At that time, the interpreter should welcome the parent, explain the interpreter's role, and remind participants about pacing, slowing down, and clarifying. My name is Daniel. Hi, I'm Kelly Pushel. Hi, Hi. Leanne Shear. Yeah. Matt Bryant. Matt, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I'll be your interpreter today. Um, a few basic things before we start. If you can keep your sentences short and try to keep the grammar simple, and that way I can. Oh, my apologies, everyone. Let me just back us up. You're using. Um, no information will really get lost that way. In case you do start to speak a little bit faster or too much information for me to um, handle or comprehend, I'll just go like this. And it'll be my signal to you to stop and that way I can catch up and tell the parent the information that she needs to know. Um, anything you want me to know? Sure. Today we're going to be talking about Vanessa, who has been assessed for special education and an eligibility in a reading disability. And this is the first time that she's been tested, and we're going to talk about the results. Okay, thank you. Are you ready for the parent? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I'll go get her. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Again, remind participants of the interpreter role. The interpreter should discuss with the team some meeting details, such as is it an annual review? Is it a three year reevaluation? What are the main points to be addressed? If possible, the team should provide the interpreter with the team meeting notes in advance. This will allow the interpreter to make notes, know the content of the meeting, and the steps of the meeting. Clear communication. Proper seating arrangements, watching for signals, and paying attention to body language all play an important part in the communication flow and help in clear communication between specialist and parent. Do sit behind the parent. Parents tend to look at the person who speaks their language and you want the parent to concentrate on the specialist. Confirm understanding and allow for questions. Remember, an interpreter is like a mouthpiece for you and an earpiece for the parent. All right, so, uh, and I, I just noticed if uh, we want to make sure to include the link to the website where these slides will be posted. So. Uh, Moses, after you get a chance, uh, after you share the uh, poll, um, if you could put the FEC inclusion link in the chat, that would be great. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna just launch a poll. If Moses, if you can launch that poll on, have you 
seen either one of these types of briefings prior to an IEP meeting before. So that would be the briefing either with the interpreter and the parent or the briefing with the uh, interpreter and the educators um, to kind of prepare for communication. And we have in the chat, uh, one of our attendees is saying no um, at, uh, at, that uh, you haven't seen this before. And the website where the, these slides will be posted is in the chat and we will be, uh, we will also be sending a follow-up email that will include both uh, an evaluation survey and um, where you can find these slides as well. So thank you everyone for, for asking that great question. Okay, so we have 71% of people who have voted. So I think we're gonna just uh, end the polling. Moses, if you can end our polling now. Okay, and then share results. And so now we see kind of a good split of uh, folks who have seen a uh, briefing before, um, those who've, who haven't seen the briefing before, and then uh, peop, uh, some of you are also unsure of it. Okay. All right, so we're going to uh, let's see if we can close that out. All right. And we see in the chat, I have seen it. It is more casual and may, be more, may or may not be intentional. Uh, I have only seen a briefing between staff and interpreter when we have been lucky enough to have Fanny as our interpreter. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. You are lucky if you can have Fanny as your interpreter. And uh, I voted yes. What I have seen are briefings with school staff. I have not personally seen parent briefings. Okay, thank you very much for that feedback. Okay, so now, now we're gonna view a video that compares what, what's called an improper and then a proper process and kind of ask you to reflect on what you notice about communication. Um, in these two scenarios. So here we go. Hi. Hey, how are you guys? Hola. Hola, buenas tardes. Hey, good afternoon. Um, we're going to have a meeting today to talk about Vanessa and some testing that we did. We have an agenda on the board of some things we thought we would talk about. Tenemos unas cuantas cosas en el pizarrón de cosas que queremos hablar, como una agenda. Are there any other things that the parent would like to discuss? ¿Algunas otras cosas que usted quisiera hablar? Me gustaría saber cuándo puedo esperar tareas. I would like to know when I could expect some homework. Sure, we can put that on the agenda. Podemos agregar eso también. Hi. Hola. My name is Matt Bryant. Yo soy Matt Bryant. Hi, Leanne. Good to see you. Hola, Leanne. And I'm Kelly. Nice to meet you. Yo soy Kelly. Mucho gusto. Mucho gusto. We're going to talk about some of the testing that's been done for Vanessa over the last couple of weeks. And I'm one of the learning specialists that did some of the testing. And I'm Leanne, her classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. Yo soy maestra. And I'm Matt, and I'm a learning specialist, and I did another portion of the testing. Before we started the meeting today, we came up with an agenda of some things that we thought we would talk about. Antes de la reunión tuvimos una agenda que preparamos acerca de unas cuantas cosas que quisiéramos platicar. We're going to focus on the testing that we did, and we're also going to review your parent rights. Vamos a enfocarnos en el examen que hicimos y también en sus derechos como padre. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about today? Hay algo más que le gustaría hablar hoy? Me gustaría saber si... Oh, perdón. Me gustaría saber si eh, podemos, cuándo puedo esperar tareas. I would like to know when I could expect some homework. Okay, yeah, we can talk sure. about that.
This pamphlet outlines your rights as a parent of a child who's being evaluated for special education services. Esta libreta demuestra sus derechos como padre de un estudiante que está siendo evaluado para servicios especiales de educación especial. Two points that I think you'll want to pay attention to are prior notice of special education action. Dos puntos que creo que son importantes que usted note son notificación de acción. And consent for evaluation. Y permiso para evaluación. Do you have any other questions? No, gracias. Okay. And so before we kind of reflect on this, I just wanted to address a question in the chat. Uh, the recording of this video will be available on the family, in, the fecinclusion.org website uh, after, uh, after our webinar is done. So it will be available there. Okay, so now in the chat, if you can um, respond or reflect on what did you notice that helped with communication uh, in this video. Also, Joy. <clears throat> sure, yeah, Moses. There's a question in the chat says, uh, is the agenda in Spanish? Yeah, this uh, agenda, it doesn't look to me like it is in Spanish. It seems to be in English. Um, but it certainly is really important that the uh, communi for communication purposes that the information is provided in the parent's uh, language. And I saw that on the reflections, I love all of your responses here. I couldn't see if the teaching staff were looking directly at the parent or the interpreter. Really good point. I thought the process was to look at the parent, not the interpreter. Yeah, absolutely, Michelle. You want to talk to the parent and look at the parent. And if you look at this video here and see where the uh, interpreter is setting, sitting, that's really intentional. He's sitting behind the parent. Um, as a visual reminder and a cue that, you know, it's the parent you should be speaking with. And we saw eye contact and uh, talking to the parent, not the interpreter. Again, the uh, team spoke to the parent in the second video rather than the, uh, rather than the interpreter. Uh, in scenario one, which uh, I, they refer to as the improper process, the parent was not addressed directly. And then, yeah, excellent. Uh, here it says the agenda, asking for parent additions to the agenda, right? So that agenda and the topics discussed in that meeting, they are decided in partnership with the parent. And so that was a, that's a really great call out. Uh, when the parent asked to add something to the agenda. And then I think it was homework, they added it there. Uh, and uh, is there anything else that anyone wants to share about this particular? Uh, yeah, Danielle. Um, I just, I think that part of what went so much more smoothly in the second example was that everyone was giving the time necessary around each of the statements being made to really allow for the interpretation to happen, to reflect on what was being asked, to include the parent in all the details of the agenda so that she could include her ideas and add to the process and work in partnership with them, as you pointed out. So I think um, it's really an example of how intentional it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Danielle. And I see uh, if it's in English, how would the parent know what to add, right? That's an excellent point that uh, uh, the, it's, it's, really apparent, it's, it's really important that information is provided in uh, the parent or the family or the guardian's uh, language. All right, so we're gonna move on to a video on accuracy and pacing and then reflect on what you noticed there. Accuracy, pacing. Remember, keep it simple. Use simple grammar. The grammar structure is different between languages. Avoid abstract words because certain words or phrases may not have the same literal meaning. Pace the meeting. 
No side conversations. Watch for cues and signal when needed. Confirm understanding. Keep participants involved. Make sure the interpretation is being understood, clear, and accurate. Listen for a response that doesn't coincide with the original question and ask for clarification. Vanessa was administered a battery of tests including the Woodcock-Johnson 3 test of achievement and cognitive abilities. These tests... Vanessa was administered a group of tests including a battery from the Woodcock-Johnson 3. A Vanessa administered an exam of batteries, including the Woodcock-Johnson 3. Uh, uh, disculpe, a Vanessa la llevaron al bosque a jugar con baterías. Quién es Johnson? You took Vanessa to the woods to play with batteries, and who's Johnson? Let's try it again. <laughs> when we evaluated Vanessa, we used some tests. Cuando evaluamos a Vanessa, usamos unos exámenes, including a test named the Woodcock Johnson three. Incluido un examen que se llama el Woodcock Johnson three. Oh. <laughs> These tests include tests of achievement un examen de habilidades cognitivas, that focus on reading, writing, and math, que se enfocan en leer, escribir, y matemáticas. as well as a whole separate battery of tests Igual como una cantidad de exámenes separados, that focus on cognitive abilities. Que se enfocan en habilidades cognitivas. All right. So now again in the chat, uh, what did you notice about accuracy and or pacing in this video? Right, so Danielle, right, Danielle notes the educators had to correct course. Danielle, did you wanna speak any more to that? Um, I think just to say that when we're thinking about communication. Um, it, it's never um, going to be perfect all the time because we're just humans. So in order to kind of work with interpreters effectively and, and communicate with families, um, it's really important to go into these meetings and these conversations with the sense that we're really listening intentionally and ready to shift when we need to. So when the interpreter raised his hand to kind of slow down the speech of the educator, the educator had to kind of sit back and take a breath and slow down. When the parent misunderstood the name of the test, he had to rethink about how to share the information in a way that would make sense in Spanish um, so that she would understand what he was referring to. Yeah, thank you so much, Danielle, for that. Um, right, it, we we aren't uh, you know we aren't perfect, and we don't aim to be perfect all the time. And so it's really critical that we acknowledge the importance of course correction. Uh, and I'm also just gonna uh, read out a really uh, insightful feedback from Anna. Uh, I've received feedback from parents in regards to interpreters sitting slightly behind the parent. Some prefer to be able to see the interpreter and have more direct eye contact. I understand that the video tries to emphasize the transparency of the interpreter, but we must be aware of what makes parents comfortable and what fosters communication. Yeah, excellent point, Anna. So that that really uh, is just to drive home the the point that it's you know there's no formula. There's no this is this is all these things that you have to do every single time. It's really individualized for the communication and the relationship that you're building with that parent and family. So thank you so much, Anna, for that point. Uh, and even when pacing was adjusted, there was still some rephrasing. There was a lot more high vocabulary, uh, more abstract, higher vocabulary, battery of tests versus group or collection of tests. Uh, the educator slowed down when prompted by the interpreter's hand signal. He used battery twice, which is a difficult word for a non-English speaker. And it can be a fine line between using basic structure and speaking slow versus dumbing it down or not giving parents sufficient information. Mm -hmm. Great point. And then uh, Fanny, uh, interesting point, Catherine. 
I've used both ways, sitting behind and next to the parent. We're now facing remote meetings and that's bringing a whole other set of factors. Okay, uh, and I'm just gonna read this last one here. I think pacing is so important, especially when IEP meetings are being conducted over Zoom with interpreters. It can be difficult with audio lag to make sure we don't have people talking over each other. Thank you for highlighting this with this video. Thank you very much, Carrie. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Before you do that, Joy, if I can add sure. a little bit, and I also tossed it up in the chat. Um, so one thing too that um, is, would be important to keep in mind is the accessibility of what that signal is gonna be. So in this video, the interpreter raised hand to signal, okay, hold on a second, slow down, right? Um, so having an understanding though, um, that the, the signal, whatever that signal is going to be for that meeting is something that's not only accessible to the interpreter, whether it's um, because the interpreter is blind or there are, um, uh, there's an educator um, who's blind, just having those considerations around that understanding about what that signal is going to be, or if there are um, like because of mobility. Um, so that's one thing that I would just include here to keep that in mind, that sig that's whatever that signal is gonna be, making sure that it's accessible to everybody. Thank you so much, Jordanos. That's such a valuable point. Okay, now we're gonna move on to uh, a video on side conversations. And so we have three more videos, including this one. Okay. So now that we know we're going to provide services to Vanessa, we have to decide where that 60 minutes of reading instruction is going to come in her day. So this instruction is going to have to come in addition to what's going on in your class. Okay, well I have my schedule here and I have... I need to interpret everything you're saying. So when you're talking, if you could have a pause between each one of you, and that way I can interpret for her. Sure. Okay. So we're going to try and figure out um, her schedule. Vamos a ver en su horario para ver cuáles días podemos, a qué horas del día podemos hacer los 60 minutos. So I have my reading block first thing in the morning. Yo tengo mi grupo de lectura primera cosa en la mañana. At 8.30. A las ocho y media. And it's 90 minutes. Y es 90 minutos. So could Vanessa come to you after that? Sure. ¿Puede Vanessa ir contigo después de eso? Sure. Sure. Okay. ¿Y Vanessa va a poder, tiene que ir a otra escuela? ¿Necesita transporte? No, aquí mismo no tienen esta escuela, no hay que tener ningún transporte. Is there a question that we can answer? Hay una pregunta que podemos contestar nosotros. Uh, Vanessa necesita transporte para ir a otra escuela para esta lectura adicional. Does Vanessa need transport to another school for this additional reading? Uh, no, this yeah. is going to be in addition to her reading class and it will be in the same classroom. No, esto va a ser aparte de su lectura regular y va a ser en su, propio, en su propia clase. Oh. Okay, and so I just want to be conscious of time too. So. Uh, you know, our reflections on this particular one may be shorter, but in the chat, what did you notice about the side conversations? And uh, what I noticed is that, um, you know, the, the, there were side conversations between the educators uh, and the interpreter was able to pause and course correct for that. And then there was also a side conversation with the interpreter and the parent and the educator asked, you know, uh, in, in a really skillful way, is there anything we can address with that question? And so, and you see in the chat, side conversations include the rest of the group. The side conversations were disruptive to the overall process. All right, so that's Excellent points. And so we're going to just move along here. Oh, uh, Danielle, did you want to say anything? Um, I guess I just wanted to point out how critical it is that um, side conversations be brought out into the open and interpreted effectively because um, misunderstandings can cause hurt feelings and they can cause really meetings to shut down. I've witnessed it myself when 
there was laughter that was unexplained or when there were side conversations that felt disrespectful. So it's really critical, I think, that um, everyone involved interrupts those private conversations and brings them out into the open as part of the communication. Thank you so much, Danielle. And we, we have a really excellent question here coming in through uh, the questions to us. And so I'm gonna just address it. Is it okay to check in with the interpreter to see if they understand your meeting? Absolutely. Yes, it's, uh, we always want to uh, do as much as we can to check for understanding, uh, whether that's with the parent, the educator, the interpreter. So it's, it's, it's recommended actually that, we, that you do that, okay? So thank you very much for that, that question. I'm sure uh, many others had that question as well. Okay, so we're gonna watch a meet, uh, video on concluding the meeting. Thank you for coming in today. Um, if you have any questions, you can call the school and they know how to get a hold of me. If the person who answers the phone doesn't speak Spanish, you can let them know that you need a Spanish-speaking person. And they'll get someone within the building immediately. Thank you, that's great. Do you have any questions before we end today? No, no. Okay. Muchas gracias. Thank, Thank you for coming in. Okay, so again in the chat, what are some good takeaways from this way of concluding the meeting? Um, some good takeaways from this way of concluding the meeting. And I, I think we all really appreciate how active all of you are in the chat and all the insight that you're providing. Um, it's always difficult to know within this environment um, and kind of back and forth. Um, and Pam, uh, Pam asked, would it be good to have a welcoming statement in Spanish learned and an ending sentence to say thank you to the parent? Uh, I'm not sure, Does do Danielle or your Danos and family want to address that question? Um, I'm not 100% clear about the question. I think um, maybe it's just the idea of having a welcoming statement in Spanish. So whether the educators um, could have a welcoming statement in Spanish at the beginning and at the end to thank the parent, um, even if they don't speak Spanish more fluently and generally during the meeting, I think is the question. And I think any way to build relationships is really positive and um, trying to, I mean, I heard one of the educators say Donata, say you're welcome in Spanish during the meeting. And I think, you know, it's all just about communication. It's all just, um, you know, efforts for people to connect and, and, do our best to communicate with one another. So I think all of those are good ideas. Mm -hmm. I hope I understood your question correctly. Yeah, I was searching for the, the question in the chat, but if I'm understanding it correctly, I think if it leads with authenticity, um, it can be helpful. And as Danielle said, like in the video, the words that the um, school staff were able to say like they did. So just coming from a place of authenticity can really go a long way in building that relationship. Thank you so much. Um, and we have lots of great uh, responses in the chat and I'm just recognizing the time. So uh, I like the way they explain to the parent how to get a hold of someone who speaks their language and explain to the parent what will happen in the future to communicate. Absolutely. Um, and Monique, letting the parent know how to receive language access in other circumstances. So you both just really hit it uh, hit, uh, 
I guess the euphemism is hit the nail on the head. I'm not sure I've used that before, but um, that what they did here is that they told the parent in the future, uh, when you want to follow up or reach out to us, uh, language access and interpreters are available, please ask. And then this is what would be even more helpful is the name and the contact information um, of the person you're gonna follow up with. Okay, so we're gonna just um, move through here and watch our last video uh, and then end with our, and our, with our final poll. Oh, well, let me just play the video. Debriefing. Debriefing is helpful for all parties involved to share what worked. Give positive feedback. How do you think it went? Specialist and interpreter can share information and questions. Interpreter can mention his experience regarding the family beliefs and culture. Ask, what can we do to make it better next time? All right, so uh, just to wrap up this particular video, Moses, if you can launch uh, the poll on, have you seen a debriefing happen before? The debriefing um, with the interpreter, with educators, um, on how it went and how to improve uh, in the future. So we'll just, uh, we're at 50% of voting. Um, and uh, in the chat we see, I have seen a debriefing happen with the parent and the interpreter. Okay, we just, um, all right, so Moses, if you can end the poll and then share the results. There have been some instances where you've seen debriefings happen. Uh, the majority of you who responded haven't seen a debriefing happen. And so just to reflect on how kind of critical, right, that debriefing is um, to improve our communication uh, uh, going forward. Just like, you know, for a webinar such as this or presentations you've given, you'll debrief with your team or your people to improve um, your practices going forward. Kind of that same best practice applies here in this really critical meeting with the parent. Okay, so we're gonna just end that poll and move in to another question. Again, in the chat, um, what are some of the ways that you as educators could manage conversations through interpreters who may not be as clear about their role or the process as the interpreter in the video. So what are some of the ways, if the interpreter in the video, if you don't have Fanny there um, at your meeting, um, what are some of the ways that you as educators could manage conversations through interpreters? We have, as you're putting in info, we have debriefing is important. And this is ideal way to do meetings. However, often they're not even time to do intro and debriefing with IEPs. I think we could initiate some of these effective practices such as the pre-meeting debrief, reminding people to speak directly to the family, establishing norms before the meeting, interpreters are not often given enough hours in advance to prep either so maybe something to think in advance as school and ospi plan iep time one is not enough to get through iep with interpreter mm -hmm. starting with the briefing would be wonderful um, teams can reach consensus at the start of the meeting to agree on signals and process assign roles and then, yeah, we will be addressing remote meetings shortly, um, requesting a briefing to establish norms. Uh, okay, and some clarifications. Okay, thank you 
you very much, everyone. Um, and unless our panelists have another point that you want to make, and you can signal to me with a raised hand. Joy, I do have a question that came in uh, Q&A. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I feel it's a pretty good question. It says, in some school districts, is it required to provide a translation of special education documents, even if an interpreter is present? Are you finding that this is the case in your area or is it suggested slash recommended? Right, so that's an excellent question that we really puzzled through in the language access work group. Um, and the, um, and I've, uh, we've kind of gone back and forth with uh, OEO and OSPI Office of Civil Rights. There is some confusion around whether the translation of IEPs are mandatory. Um, and and uh, there's some like confusion wrapped up in dear colleague letters as well. Uh, Danielle, do you wanna speak to that at all? I think, um it's best practice to provide both written translations and interpretation um, during meetings to go into the nuances and explanation around the documents. But um, ideally, um, translations, you know, prior written notices are required to be translated. And, um, you know, in an ideal world, all of the documents would be translated. So. I, I think um, that um, there's a question, is an IEP considered a vital document? And I think it is considered a vital document. Um, and so I think that part of the reason why the language access work group came to be is that there isn't consistent um, language access with uh, interpretation and translations across the state of Washington. Um, and there's so much variability that your questions, you know, are really important, good questions, and they make sense because we've all seen a whole range of different approaches. Um, but I think we would all agree that the more language access, the better. Um, so we're trying to um, create you know, an improved situation for families and educators to communicate. Right, absolutely. And what we learned is that there's confusion around the law around this, particularly around the translation of IEPs as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna summarize some key points here. Uh, so it's important to introduce all people in the meeting to talk to the parent and family and not the interpreter, to check for understanding, be aware of accuracy and pacing, limit technical language jargon, avoid side conversation, let the parent and family know how to follow up and request language support, and then debrief the meeting. And we had hoped to break for five minutes um, but we're, we're, we're not going to do that. I apologize. Uh, just because we've had so much rich uh, conversations in the chat. So, uh, but please, uh, you're welcome to just move around and uh, as we continue to move through because next Fanny, your Donis, is there anything you wanted to add? No, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and Danielle, did you want to add anything? I'm, I don't want to take too much time. This is pretty quick, but we, we didn't quite get to the conversation of what should educators do um, if the interpreter isn't experienced. Um, and I think that it's easy um, when as an educator, we might not be as experienced working with interpreters to defer to the interpreter because the interpreter is the one person in the room who speaks both languages and understands both languages. But the fact is that as educators, it's the role of the educator, and I'm a former educator, um, so I, th I think it's the educator's role to really um, manage all the conversations that we have with families. And that includes conversations through interpreters. 
So some of the ways that the interpreter in the video managed that conversation, those are things that, you know, educators can take on. Um, and just to really check for understanding and um, making sure that communication is really happening effectively. And the more experience that we have in managing those conversations through interpreters, the easier it becomes and the more second nature it becomes. But it takes some time to learn through the experience. So Thank I just wanted so much, to add Danielle. that, sorry. Yeah, excellent point. Thank you so much. All right, so we're gonna hand it off to Fanny to talk on uh, remote interpretation best practices. Okay, so, you know, here we are in this uh, pandemic, we've been catapulted to remote. We're all adapting, there's glitches and we, we're doing the best we can. So uh, since the pandemic, all of my IEP meetings have been remote and they've been in consecutive mode. Uh, at first, there was a real problem uh, with the parents joining the platform. <clears throat> Most of them were joining by phone. And then, so then we would have the parent on the phone and everyone else on, on the video. And also there's cases where there's uh, an interpreter coming in from language line on the phone who's not, who's not on the screen who can't see the IEP or anything that's being displayed. And so we have to be prepared for how to handle this. Um, so remote, uh, as I said, I've done it consecutively, remote simultaneous, that is not something that I've seen much of uh, here, which is speaking at the same time. And that's that has to be done. That's usually a technology issue because the platform has to accommodate various channels or interpreters are doing it very creatively with a phone bridge, but that would take a whole other webinar to talk about. So for IEP meetings, of course, someone should reach out to the family before the meeting and find out if they've got a computer or a smartphone or if they're gonna be joining by phone. And uh, if there is some help, uh, for example, I, I uh, interpreted for a family that had a computer, but they needed tech help. And so I interpreted for that family in the tech department prior to the IEP meeting so that they could be on, uh, so it could work. Um, if the family participates by phone, obviously you're gonna to need to send that IEP document beforehand by regular mail or make arrangements for that family to pick it up because they're not gonna see it. Uh, and as an educator, be prepared to ask questions and take charge if the interpreter is not taking charge. For example, as uh, Danielle mentioned, you know, and we saw in the video side conversations, noise, joking, it, laughing. I mean, it, 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 the parent may not know what, why people are laughing, so it could cause some confusion. Next slide. Um, again, reach out to the parent uh, to find out about this technology. And if there is help, how does the parent get the help? Who do they call? Those things, what, what they're gonna save you is scheduling this meeting with, 10, with six people and all just waiting and wondering is the parent gonna come or, uh, or not? And so, um, and it's important because people are using multiple platforms. They're using Google Meet, they're using um, Zoom or Teams. And so not just do you have the computer, but do you have the app and do you know how to use it? Uh, and of course, we talked about introductions. That's really important, is especially if, you, if your interpreter is not a staff interpreter or someone that you've worked with before, because they won't really, they're gonna be really focused on hearing on the audio because it's more challenging in Zoom. And so they're not gonna be looking so much in these little boxes to figure out who's talking. So it can be really good. And um, I know that I, I say this in my pre-sessions, please, when you speak, say who you are. Hi, this is Mary, I'm the SLP, or this is Susie, I'm the ELL for the transitions. And that's gonna be really important for the phone interpreter and for the parent who's on the phone who can't see 
or figure out that it's a new face speaking. So um, let's see. I always inform at, at the beginning that if uh, there isn't a, if the parent is not able to log on that I'm prepared to use a phone bridge and I, and I state how I'm going to do that. And so I've done that before and I'll just have the parent on the phone and muted the Zoom while I'm interpreting. So we're not uh, speaking over each other. Um, let's see. I talked about that. This is another thing with the noise, and, and this is happening more because people have more than one child and they're not in an office. So they could be, it could be really noisy. And so if that's the situation with a family, the educator should inform the protocol about muting oneself when, when not speaking because otherwise the interpreter has to do it because it will just be chaotic. The interpreter will not be hearing very well. And um, so I do it. <laughs> if, if the educator doesn't do it, I, I say, okay, ma uh, Senora Martinez, por, por favor, could you silence? And I'll, and I'll guide her. This is the button that you push. You know, you really have to take the time to do that. Next slide. After the introductions, the interpreter should establish how uh, there will, they will ask for a pause. We saw in the clips that the interpreter went like that to, uh, to ask about clarification or slowing down. But of course, if people are not on video, then, or if the interpreter is coming on the, on, the, on the phone, then there won't be a visual. Um, uh, Sorry, when I, when I introduce uh, my, my signal that I'm going to do this, uh, if I need a repetition or slow down, I, I like to ask, I don't always do it, but I'd like to ask, can someone please help me by keeping an eye out for my signal? Because they'll only know if, if they're looking for that. And uh, just wait a few seconds to, for the team to acknowledge what I said. So if, if the, if uh, the interpreter is not on video, they're going to have to use their voice. They're going to have to say, the interpreter requests a repetition, or the interpreter did not hear that. Could, could you repeat that? Or uh, the interpreter is not familiar with ESY. You know, maybe it's a new interpreter, does, works in medical or in court, and they're just hearing ESY or LRE. They have no idea what it is. So um, they'll have to interview you know, they'll have to ask for clarification because otherwise the interpretation won't be complete and accurate. Um, so we talked about that. And, and also th that goes for the parent too. Sometimes a parent may have a lot to share in, in, which is okay, but it maybe it will talk for a, a many multiple sentences. And I will say some, I will in interrupt and say, uh, Un momento, uh, tengo que interpretar. I'll, I'll interrupt and say I, I need to interpret uh, so that nothing is lost, so we don't lose content. Uh, let's see. And uh, I had put something in the chat uh, because so someone had asked, oh, "Well, how do you check for understanding?" And as an educator, you you have you have uh, the opportunity to just pause or, or say, you know, this is a lot of information. I want to make sure uh, that uh, you don't have any questions about the receptive goals. I mean, sometimes this receptive, expressive, fluency, it all is like, uh, you know, the, 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 those are words that are dense with meaning about a goal, an educational goal. So, you know, sometimes just take that time to say expressive, receptive. Um, Fine motor skills, you know, I just translate that as uh, using your hand, because if I, if I s interpret that jargon, fine motor skills, most parents are, are not really sure what that means. Uh, at the end of the meeting, indicate to parent, just like in the clip, who they can contact with questions, whether it's a specific email address for those parents who use email, not all, all parents will, um, with a contact person and a phone number or just how to request an interpreter. This is the number if, if you have that available. Um, and then the post to session, 
uh, that's really uh, the icing on the cake. It's sometimes those five minutes could identify just a little something that could help for the next meeting. And that's about all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fanny. And we, we do recognize the time. And so I just want to answer the one question. We'll just address this one question uh, that's in the uh, Q&A for you, Fanny, specifically. Fanny, do you recommend simultaneous interpretation for Zoom meetings? particularly for community meetings. We just had one actually, the Investing in Student Potential Coalition meeting, particularly for community meetings with multiple languages and several staff families attending. Absolutely, absolutely and simultaneous because uh, you, you will have, if, if it's a one hour meeting, it'll be two hours with consecutive because everything has to be repeated twice. So simultaneous, um, with, uh, with the supportive technology. Joy knows about this. You do not wanna have a Zoom meeting with multiple channels uh, which, without some tech support, okay? Uh, we had a situation where we had Mandarin, Cantonese, Spanish, and for some reason, the Cantonese interpreter's speech was bleeding into the Spanish uh, interpreter and it, it it was confusing and a quick chat saying, okay, this is what's happening, uh, took care of it. But yes, definitely simultaneous and definitely with, uh, get some tech support. I'm sure there's a tech help in the district and, and they should be helping. I, I know they're probably taxed with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, requests, but, but the, the, one of the reasons why it's not used very much is because it does require some tech uh, support. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Fanny. And uh, we will be we will be creating a short video on setting up for simultaneous interpretation uh, in Zoom meetings as well. So please look out on the fecinclusion.org webpage resource library for that video. Okay. Um, if it's okay with you, your Donos and Danielle, I'm gonna um, just move us quickly through these three communication tools um, without talking too much about them uh, because these are available online and then the interpreter evaluation form will be available on the fecinclusion.org page soon. Uh, the tool on the left-hand side is a communication tool from OEO and it's on communicating with families and there are that's available uh, and Moses has dropped that link um, to to the chat and so this is just a wealth of information so we highly recommend you read it but we have covered and Danielle yes really quick I just want to point out that this document was written for educators um, our office put it together to really share detailed information about resources and how to work effectively with interpreters. So um, please take a look at it when you have a chance. Okay, and then we have this interpreter support tip card. So this is, uh, Moses will also be putting, oh, you put the language access page in the chat. And so that's where you can find this resource and just take a look at it um you know on your on your leisure time uh and then we have this interpreter evaluation form for families on the left hand side it's in english and then on the right hand side in spanish and odmf has this in uh i would say 15 plus languages and we'll be posting it in the fecinclusion.org uh resource library and Moses has posted the interpreter tip cards in the chat. Um, so just very briefly, there is policy change uh, related to language access in Washington state, the bill that passed form the language access work group, uh, HB 1130, where we worked intensively and provided recommendations. And so this is a picture of uh, the first uh, language access work group meeting right after. And there are, um, there's details on the 
language access work group um, that is convened, co-convened by OSPI and OEO. Um, not sure if any of you can po put that link to the OSPI language access work group in the chat. Uh, and we, we did make some headway uh, with a new bill that summed up all the work group recommendations, House Bill 1153. These are images of uh, our stakeholders testifying, including OEO and ODMF. Um, unfortunately, this bill died in House Appropriations. And so we're still kind of keeping up the fight uh, to push for a budget proviso. So that's money uh, appropriated to OEO and OSPI to implement a, a technical assistance program and to reconvene the work group again. So uh, please uh, stay tuned and help us advocate for this budget proviso to get uh, uh, help, uh, more help on the way to families. Okay, and so you can, uh, just here are our websites to connect with us. And if you all can put your uh, contact info or email addresses in the chat. So people, if people want to connect with you or ask questions, that would be great. And um, I'll just close here with, uh, just a request that you provide feedback on our webinar. We want to continue to do better um, and to provide better support and uh, professional development to you all. So Moses has posted the link in the chat. And with that, we really wanna thank everyone for attending our webinar. Uh, and we'll end uh, with the fecinclusion.org webpage where you can learn more about us. So thank you so much everyone for coming. I know it was a great deal of info and I also just wanna thank our remarkable partners, um, Danielle and Fanny and Jordanos and Moses and I, you know, we really wanna thank you all for kind of working with us to provide this opportunity and, and thank you so much everyone for joining us. Um, so that, that really concludes our webinar and we will be posting a um, recording of the webinar again on the FEC inclusion webpage. So thank you very much. And if you all wanna unmute and say your own thank yous, that would be great. Joy, I just want to read one specific comment that was in the chat. They asked if we could um, if we could send out all the links that we posted in the chat to the to the participants that joined. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, definitely can do that in the follow up email um, to participants. So that's a great that's a great uh, suggestion. And we will also be posting it in the resource library, the FEC inclusion resource library will have um, highlights on these resources as well. Thank you everyone for coming and joining us. Yeah, I just also wanted to thank everyone for joining the webinar and feel free to reach out to any of us um, with, with questions or um, to talk more about um, providing effective language access. We'd love to have those conversations and continue the work to improve things in the state. All right, well, goodbye everyone. I am going to end us. Thank you again.